Hello, my name is Linda Gordon, Senior Curator, Historic Houses with Bristol Culture. I will be taking you into the house and talking about the people who lived here. In this talk, I will be discussing how the transatlantic slave trade involved or impacted the people of this household. At the end, I will be putting up links to more information on the topic so you can learn more about transatlantic slave trade, Bristol's role in it and early black presence in Bristol. This link also includes research used to help create this talk. Most of our information on Pinney and the people in the household comes from research carried out by curators at Bristol Culture, alongside the work of academics David Small, Christine Eichelman and Madge Dresser, who have worked hard to bring these stories out. Pinney kept diaries, ledgers and letters that cover large parts of his life. This is where most of our first-hand information comes from. The Pinney family papers can be found in the special collections at Bristol University. Other information has been researched by our colleagues at Bristol Archives. At the moment the house is shut due to the current COVID-19 pandemic and we're not sure when it will reopen. But when it does, you can visit the upper rooms with dedicated displays on the Pinneys, Perro Jones and Fanny Coker and how their stories are part of transatlantic slavery. During the month of June, Bristol has been in the news with Colston acting as a catalyst for local and international conversations. The issue of slavery hangs over many traders and merchants in Bristol and across the UK. We are dedicated to bringing these stories to the public and ensuring these histories are not forgotten. Welcome to Georgian House, 7 Great George Street, Bristol. John and Jane Pinney moved into this house in 1791. It was newly built for them and is now a museum. It gives an idea of what life was like at that time for this plantation owner, his family and his servants. In 1762, at the age of 22, John Pinney inherited property in the West Country and sugar plantations on the island of Nevis in the Caribbean. This included inheriting an enslaved workforce. Two years later, he arrived on Nevis to run the plantations himself. There he married Jane Weeks, the daughter of another plantation owner. In 1783, after the American War of Independence had ended, Pinney left his estates in the care of managers and returned to England. The family settled in Bristol and built this house. Pinney inherited sugar plantations, but they were debt laden. He spent 20 years making the plantations profitable. He used the labour of enslaved people to achieve this. One of the first things he did when he arrived in Nevis was to buy Africans from the slave traders, people who had been forcibly brought from West Africa. He also bought enslaved people from his neighbours to replace workers worn out by the terrible conditions and hard labour of sugar production. Much of his fortune was built on the backs of his enslaved workers. On one of his plantations, called Mount Traverse, Pinney owned between 170 and 210 people. They produced, on average, about 30,000 kilograms of sugar and around 33,000 litres of rum per year. Let us enter the house. As a business visitor to John Pinney, you would have been shown into the study. When Pinney left Nevis for England, he was worth about £70,000. It is hard to equate historic monetary values in modern terms, but an estimate would be that it equates to roughly £7.5 million today. The family settled in Bristol and he set up the firm of Pinney and Tobin, West India merchants, with fellow Nevis sugar planter James Tobin. They acted as agents for other plantation owners, lending money, sending out equipment and supplies, and selling their own and others' sugar cargoes in England. Believing that Britain's wealth rested on slavery, 
James Tobin was an active campaigner on behalf of the slave trade. He worked with both the Bristol and London branches of the West India Committee and was a national spokesman for the pro-slavery campaign. As the owner of a plantation and enslaved Africans, he felt he had a better understanding of the issues than the abolitionists, few of whom had been to the Caribbean. He accused them of being either naive or liars. By the 1780s and 90s, the slave trade run from Bristol was past its peak, but still an important part of the trade in the city. Of equal, or more importance, was the West India trade, where local manufacturers supplied the needs of the islands, and the islands supplied sugar to the growing refining industry of Bristol. The Bristol West India Association was founded in 1789 to counter the local abolition committee. Tobin and his fellow merchants felt they had to create these pro-slavery advocacy groups. The year before, in 1788, Bristol became the first city outside of London to set up a committee for the abolition of the slave trade. Bristolians like Robert Southey, Hannah Moore and Anne Yearsley and Somerset-based William Wordsworth and Samuel Coleridge wrote against the trade on economic, humanitarian and Christian grounds. When Penny died in 1818, before the abolition of slavery, he was worth £340,000, almost £23 million today. Part of his fortune was made from sugar, grown and processed by enslaved workers. Another part came from acting as an agent in Bristol for other sugar planters. It is important to remember that even though Penny was very wealthy from his plantations, he was by no means a one-off. Many merchants in Bristol, England and across Europe were engaging in the transatlantic slave trade and it was interwoven at all levels of society. We don't have many objects in this house that actually belong to Pinny, but this desk is one of them. It has a direct connection with Pinny's role as a sugar planter. This mahogany plantation desk came from Nevis and was probably used in the estate's counting house or office. People would visit the house for business and pleasure. Let us move into the eating room where Jane Penny, John's wife, would have greeted you. The room is laid out for breakfast. Jane and most of her young family lived their early lives in Nevis, where breakfast would have been cassava breads, cakes, fruits, pigeon pies, hams, all served with hot chocolates, teas and coffees. She may have brought these traditions back to England with her. Tea, hot chocolate and coffee were drunk with breakfast, mid-morning and mid-afternoon. This boosted sales of slave-produced sugar. These fashionable drinks were naturally bitter in taste and needed sugar to sweeten them. It became one of the tools of the abolitionists, particularly women, to boycott the use of such sugars. This was one of the first political campaigns in which women were allowed to be involved and they played an active role. This bowl reads, West India sugar, not made by slaves. In the dining room are a set of plates from John Pinney's dessert service. The original service was from China. Chinese porcelain was very fashionable and services with a family coat of arms painted on each piece were a way to show status. Let us sit down to a Christmas dinner, 1803. A large family party has gathered in the house. They include John and Jane Pinney, one of their daughters, Elizabeth, with her husband, Peter Bailey, and his father, Evan Bailey, MP for Bristol. The Baileys ran a family business, trading with the Caribbean islands and owning plantations with enslaved workers. Evan Bailey had been a slave trader himself, investing in six slaving voyages to Nigeria all of which set sail from Bristol in the 1780s. The Pinnies had other regular visitors from Nevis. 
fellow plantation owners and their families, like the Arthurtons, the Braziers and the Millses, and their extended families. This included Jane's father, William Burt Weeks from Nevis, and her aunt and uncle, the Cokers from Dorset. William Coker had managed Penny's sugar plantations and is believed to have been the father of Jane's lady's maid, Fanny Coker. We will find out more about Fanny Coker on the upper floors. In the 18th century, a formal dinner consisted of several courses. The last of these was the dessert course. It was regarded as an opportunity for display and showing off wealth. Servants would have known how to arrange a centerpiece like this beautiful piece here, or simple pyramids of sweetmeats, flowers and fruits. The Penny's dessert course would have been full of sugars and fruits and preserves that Penny could obtain from the West Indies. All sweetmeats depended on sugar and the increasing demand for these delicacies fueled the sugar trade. In 1791, abolitionists, particularly women, called for people to give up slave produced sugar in hopes that cutting sales and affecting profits would hasten the end of the slave trade. 400,000 people abstained from sugar and sales in grocery shops fell by about one third. On the first floor, we are entering the library and I would like to introduce you to Pero. Pero or William Jones was Penny's valet and an enslaved man. He was born in Nevis with his sisters, Nancy and Sheba. All three were bought by Penny to work on the Mount Travers plantation in 1765. Pero was 12 years old. Penny paid 115 pounds for the three children and another adult slave. Pero was personal servant to John. He was also trained as a barber and in Nevis, he was often entrusted with large amounts of money. Pero accompanied the family on their move from Nevis to England. He lived the rest of his life in Bristol. He did get to visit Nevis in 1790 and 1794. After his second visit, he seemed to change. According to Penny, he started to drink heavily and Penny felt that his behaviour had become unacceptable. Extract from a letter written by John Penny. Bristol, May 23rd, 1798. I must also accept my servant Pero, who is very ill and now at Ashton for change of air. I much doubt his recovery. One or other of us visits him three or four times a week. He has waited on my person upwards of 32 years and I cannot help feeling much for him. Notwithstanding, he has not lately conducted himself as well as I could have wished. And then later that year, 12th of November, 1798. Pero, I am sorry to inform you, died a few months ago after being almost useless, caused by drunkenness and dissipation. Almost ever since we left Nevis in 1794, his conduct has been very reprehensible. His mistress has sent out for his box of clothes to be divided between his father and nephew. She has also sold his watch and purchased a pair of gold earrings for each of his sisters, Nancy, Eve and Sheba. Had something happened during his second visit to Nevis to bring about this change? As Pero left no writing of his life, we do not know. Perhaps after seeing his family again, the toll of being a slave and an own person may have reached the limit for him. Perhaps living with a freed slave, Fanny Coker, and not being freed himself despite his years of service was too much. It is important to remember that Pera was enslaved the whole of his life. He was not free and he was not paid a wage. He was about 45 years old and served the pennies for 32 years. He was never given his freedom. Today a bridge that spans St Augustine's Reach in the heart of Bristol Harbour bears his name in memory of just one of the many whose lives were devastated by slavery. 
In this small drawing room, I would like to introduce you to Frances Coker. Frances, or Fanny Coker, was a freed slave and domestic servant in the Penny household. She was born on the 26th of August, 1767, at Penny's Mount Traverse Plantation, and she was freed around the age of 11. Her mother was known as Black Polly. Polly was about 12 years old when she was bought by John Penny. While there is no official record of Fanny's father, he is believed to have been Penny's plantation manager and Jane's uncle, William Coker. Fanny's mother Polly also claimed that Penny was the father of one of her sons. John denied it, but it may explain why Polly's family seemed to have been favoured by the Pennies. Between 1775 and 1780, Fanny was trained as a seamstress and then schooled with two of the Pinney children. She also acted as a type of nursemaid when the Pinney children were young. She was freed in 1778 and was one of the very few slaves Pinney freed for reasons other than old age or illness. She remained in service as the maid of Jane and sailed to England. She left behind her mother, her 10 year old brother and her sister Hetty aged just two. After staying a few months in London and at William Coker's family home in Dorset, they moved to Bristol. In 1790, she accompanied the Pinney to Nevis. On her visit, she saw her mother again. Throughout her life, Fanny kept in contact with her family. She wrote letters and sent presents. She received a regular wage of three pounds per quarter the equivalent to about £3,000 a year today. On his death in 1818, Penny left her an annuity, providing she remained in Jane's service. After a short illness, Fanny died 12th of April 1820, aged 52. She was buried five days later in the Baptist burial ground, Red Cross Street, Bristol. In 1926, the graves were moved to Greenbank Cemetery, where a memorial marks the reinterment. In her will, she left 80 pounds, a metal watch, clothes and other goods to her immediate family on Nevis. Neither Perro nor Fanny left accounts of their lives, so most of our information comes from the perspective of their employer, or on Perro's case, his owner. Now we move into the large drawing room. This room was used for entertaining and is dominated by a large painting called A View of Nevis from St Kitts by Nicholas Pocock, 1790. It was commissioned by Pinney. The artist, a ship captain himself, had seen the West Indies, including Nevis, and painted a romanticised view of the island. There are no sugarcane fields and there are no enslaved people working. This is an anglicised version of Nevis. It looks like a British rural landscape and does not depict a true image of the island. I have found a modern photograph taken from roughly the same position and it shows how the painting deceives the viewer. Both Pero and Fanny would have seen this painting daily. They had families back in Nevis and we know they kept in contact through sending parcels. As soon as Fanny reached England, she sent home a locket of hair work to her mother. Many families were living between the West Indies and England. There was lots of communication between people separated by the Atlantic. We know that Fanny sent money to Nevis around the time her own mother was buying building materials from the Pinney Plantation to make her very own home. Here we can see everything, all set up for serving tea below the painting of Nevis, the major source of Pinney's wealth. I have taken a video of the servant staircase to show you the route that Perro, Fanny and the other Bristol servants would have used daily. This video is sped up because there are over 75 steps and we only have a short time for this tour. I have taken photographs of the servants' bedrooms. They are currently being used to store the museum's furniture collection so I cannot show you everything, but it gives you an idea of the rooms that they were in. 
From the back rooms, they would have been able to see the harbour themselves. They could see the masts of penny ships coming and going from Nevis. Each voyage bringing with it the possibility of news of their families on the plantations. If we follow the stairs all the way to the basement, we come into the kitchens and the servants' working areas. The pans, bowls and ladles shown in this room were made of copper and brass. Jane Penny would want any visiting servant to see how well equipped her kitchens were. Servants would talk to each other and their masters. It was important that all aspects of a visit went well, even down to the kitchens. Many of these pots and pans were made locally in Bristol. Evidence of similar Bristol-made cooking pots have been found in Nevis and other islands in the Caribbean. Such items were traded with the plantations by Bristol merchants. Plantation owners expected the same standard of living as they would have known in England. Let us meet some of the Bristol servants. Mary Chaplin, the cook, ruled the kitchen with an employer running ships to and from Nevis. She had a wide range of exotic foods to cook, ginger, guava, pineapple and turtle. She was paid 13 shillings a year. Anne Roberts worked as a housemaid. Her work included cleaning, dusting and polishing, taking hot water up for washing and emptying chamber pots. The footman, Charles Thomas, took coals upstairs and ashes downstairs. Anne laid and lit fires in the room, which created further dust and dirt to be cleaned. There are over 50 named servants in Penny's diaries and accounts. Please see the links at the end to find out more from in-depth research carried out by David Small and Christine Eichelman. The Pinnies enjoyed inviting guests to their house for parties. If the guests brought their own servants with them, they would wait in the kitchens until their master and mistress were ready to leave. This, of course, gave an unrivalled opportunity to share gossip. Since many of the family circle were planters from Nevis, servants like Fanny and Pero might have caught up on news from the island. Let us finish off in the larder and look at the sugar cone. This is a sugar cone in its final process form. It came in this shape because of the way it was made. Hot liquid sugar was left to go hard or crystallise in cone-shaped pottery moulds. To use it, pieces were broken off the comb with sharp nippers. The sugar in Penny's household would have come from his plantations. He would have had a plentiful supply. His cooks could make the most expensive sweet treats of the day to impress guests. This cone represents a trade in Bristol and beyond which enabled plantation owners and merchants to become rich and powerful through the exploitation of enslaved men, women and children. <laughs>